Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. It's time once again for another Fiber Channel Industry Association webinar on the mechanics of Fiber Channel. Our goal is to provide you a technology-centered, marketing-free edition of how Fiber Channel works, and we go deep into the mechanics of uh, Fiber Channel in order to demystify and explain why it's considered the gold standard of storage networking. Now, today's webinar is an important one because it takes a look specifically at security. We all know how important security is to our data, but it's not always clear as to how the technologies we use can help us in that regard. So for that reason, we're going to be going pretty deep into how Fiber Channel has some interesting and thorough approaches to keeping data secure. My name is Jay Metz, and I am going to be your host for today's webinar. I'm on the Board of Directors for FCIA, and I'm also the Chair of the Education Committee, the group responsible for these kinds of webinars. I'm joined today by two Fiber Channel experts, Nishant Loda from Marvell and Brandon Hoff from Broadcom, who have graciously agreed to help talk to us about security. Before we begin, a couple words of administrative trivia. Uh, the FCIA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion and education of Fiber Channel, as well as guiding future roadmaps and functionality. Our responsibility is to provide the interface between the users of Fiber Channel, who hopefully are you, the audience, and the T11 body that creates the standards. One quick note about the Bright Talk interface, which we're using to broadcast this webinar today. From time to time, we have noticed that the audio may be difficult to hear. If that is the case, um, then sometimes it helps to clear out your browser's cache. It's usually a good place to start if you find yourself having some problems. Now, if that doesn't work, feel free to use the question button in the browser to send us a message. Speaking of which, we highly encourage you to ask questions along the way. We anticipate that with a subject like security, there's probably going to be quite a few of them. Also, it's really important that we get feedback from you. At the end of the webinar, please, please don't forget to rate uh, the session and leave any comments that you wish. Our speakers work very hard to provide the best possible content, and this is the only way we can tell if we've met our mark. And finally, uh, because we get this question all the time, yes, the presentation will be available for download afterwards. Uh, we'll be providing instructions on how to get to it at the end of this webinar. Well, you didn't really think we'd give it to you up front, did you? So that's enough of me blathering away. It's time to get started. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Nishant, who's going to explain more about what we're going to be covering today. Nishant? Thank you, Jay. Uh, and hello, everyone. And thank you again for joining this FCIA webinar focused on fiber channel security, the protocol we all trust to transport storage. What we'll do today is we'll start off the discussion with a quick overview of uh, the various industry drivers for storage security, including government regulations, industries that are more sensitive to storage security. We will then review some potential data center threats that you may confront uh, in your fiber channel implementations and deployments. And then having described the drivers and the problem statements, uh, we'll jump right into outlining the details of the fiber channel security protocol hereby called FCSP2. And when we go there, uh, we'll first define what that protocol is, so where it comes from, the standard, the key terms that uh, we'll be using for the subsequent uh, section of the presentation. FCSP2 will provide us, and the, uh, our slides will detail the authentication infrastructure, the different authentication protocols, how to set up session keys, and how the protocol ensures frame-by-frame -frame integrity and confidentiality. Well, finally, towards the end, uh, uh, talk about some trade-offs before we take questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, Did we lose you? Often there is, uh, thanks, Dave. <clears throat> Often there is a lot of confusion within our industry uh, when talking about data security versus storage protection, right? Uh, 
storage security more involves keeping information private and out of the hands of anyone that is not authorized uh, uh, to see your precious data, right? Well, protection is more about availability of the data, like disaster recovery after component or data center failures. Within this slide and subsequent of the presentation, we'll focus on storage security, right? And traditionally, storage security and IT, within IT, storage security and storage has been kind of separate disciplines, right? Uh, with some overlapping ideas, overlapping concepts, but largely distinct. And in the model that you look at today, in the world that we are living in today, this model is changing. There's constant news around us about security breaches, about companies, household names, how, data was, how, how sensitive data was breached, lost, and that is leading a lot of, kind of data center architects like you all concerned about such events happening within their own data centers, right? Not only that, there are governments who are taking an increasing interest uh, in ensuring that their citizens' data is protected by passing regulations. Uh, for example, the European Union's uh, GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation, which I believe went into effect sometime last year, and that is forcing a lot of companies to take stronger measures around storage security which eventually is leading to kind of, uh, discussion on technologies that, uh, uh, that surround that. In addition, there are some verticals, especially healthcare, financial, uh, a lot of defense and government, <coughs> which uh, logically so, uh, as their information that they protect is of high value, are more under scrutiny, right? And we all kind of are still fresh in our memories, uh, breaches which have been caused by malicious insiders, what we often call uh, the Snowden effect. Right. All of this, along with new fiber channel use cases, whether it is the hybrid cloud, whether it is uh, more distributed data centers, uh, things like remote replication, and even multi-tenant data centers where a lot of different customers' data is sharing the same infrastructure, is once again igniting this discussion on storage security or more specifically fiber channel security. Okay, so, uh, you know, when I talk about a lot of these things with customers uh, and, you know, data center solution providers, I often get a matter of fact kind of question from them. Isn't fiber channel already secure? And my favorite response generally is, yes, fiber channel is secure, absolutely. But remember, no amount of security is enough, and often ignorance can be our greatest enemy. Like, while there is no doubt that fiber channel has been trusted for decades as the protocol of choice for moving storage across the wire, you know, it is not just luck that has brought fiber channel to this position of dominance, right? Uh, in fact, there are various things within the fiber channel protocol and the way it has been deployed uh, for it to gain this trust. And let's start first talking about, like, often data centers are physically secured, right? Uh, they are locked up, they are protected. Uh, not just that, fiber channel SANs typically are segregated and dedicated networks transporting storage and hence, uh, you know, generally considered secure. In addition, there's a lot of concepts within uh, defined by the fiber channel specifications. There are things like uh, uh, fiber channel zoning, which makes sure that, <coughs> you know, your fabrics are partitioned, people, nodes and entities only see what they are allowed to see. There is uh, LUN masking related uh, kind of provisions uh, which allow you to expose only selected devices uh, uh, to specific nodes. Uh, not just that, even the management interfaces, both uh, potentially in-band as well as out-of-band management are secure, and uh, both host switches as well as storage arrays are generally controlled by some kind of, uh, you know, uh, admin login password uh, uh, kind of interfaces. So, fiber channel is secure for a reason, and it's, uh, <coughs> you know, but the, what I wanted, what we all wanted to do within this presentation is kind of talk a little bit more about how the changing world is uh, is igniting the conversation again about uh, uh, fiber channel security. Okay, uh, so uh, you know while fiber channel provides a whole lot of kind of services uh, and features. Uh, uh, and the trust that people have built on fiber channel, like we discussed earlier, there are new data center threats uh, or new data center architectures that are bringing on new threats, right? We talked about distributed data centers, uh, 
uh, fiber channel being used for long distance replication, disaster recovery, multi-tenant data centers. Not only that, fiber channel deployments have been seen at massive scale, hundreds, and thousands, and multiple thousands of nodes connected together in massive fiber channel sands, which have the potential that network could potentially be misconfigured, right? <clears throat> Not only that, uh, within the fiber channel uh, protocol, there are things, for example, the name server and things like that, which have more well-known addresses, and anybody who can get access into the fiber channel network uh, can talk to these, uh, these entities uh, and glean information that uh, ideally they are not, uh, they should not be allowed to. There are, <coughs> today, if you look at fiber channel sands, right, there's, there are things that uh, uh, <coughs> the fiber channel SAN implements in terms of security. And one of the things like we discussed is zoning, which is uh, con uh, like a logical segmentation of fiber channel nodes within a uh, fiber channel fabric or a switch. And remember that zoning was not created as a security tool, right, within the fiber channel standard. It, was, it is more of a segmentation tool, right? <coughs> and, uh, uh, and many of you guys, fiber channel uh, uh, experts or people who have deployed fiber channel know that things like soft zoning, it is quite a misnomer, right? Uh, while hard zoning is enforcement based and does restrict traffic, uh, soft zoning is simply information based. Uh, and there is no per se restriction on traffic and <coughs> zoning based mechanisms are primarily segmentation like I said and not uh, you know, <coughs> authentication and encryption based. Uh, just look at LUN masking for example, right? Uh, the process of hiding or revealing uh, specific LUNs or uh, pieces of uh, a disk or a NVMe uh, to a specific fiber channel client. Uh, again, LUN masking was created as a segmentation tool, not a security tool, and does not have enforcement capabilities, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, <coughs> if LUN masking was done on the host uh, uh, or a fiber channel initiator, anybody who has admin access to that could use tools to kind of uh, subvert that. Uh, or if LUN masking was, for example, done on a storage array, uh, there could be, you know, tools within uh, attacker's arsenal like uh, worldwide name spoofing that would allow uh, this rogue initiator to get access uh, uh, to confidential uh, data. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now there is often kind of conversations about what amount of security is enough or what is appropriate security. And like I said earlier, I, I often tell uh, the customers that I talk to, just absolutely no amount of security is enough and absolutely no amount of security can guarantee you, there's nobody uh, in the world who can guarantee you 100% security, right? What you choose to deploy within your fiber channel networks is highly business and technology dependent. Uh, it's a balance of skill set within the team, what you are protecting, uh, what's the business impact if the data is lost, uh, uh, <coughs> credibility lost, any legal implications, uh, you know, what vertical your businesses reside in and things like that. And uh, within this uh, uh, FCIA educational webinar, right, what I would recommend <coughs> is for all the customers and people who are architecting their fiber channel sands uh, to thoroughly analyze their security needs, right? Whether they are deploying fiber channel, FICON, or in the future FC and VME, the protocol cannot make a security decision for you, right? And to that point, uh, one thing is very clear within this presentation, I want to say it loud and clear here, that nothing in this presentation per se provides any guarantee of any kind. This is, uh, this is about removing ignorance, building knowledge within the fiber channel community to understand uh, uh, the tenets of security within fiber channel uh, protocol itself. <coughs> okay, now let's look at uh, some potential data center security threats. So, right, let's start with uh, talking about sniffing storage traffic as many are familiar with uh, uh, <coughs> the purpose of sniffing uh, uh, storage traffic although on a dedicated or even a shared fiber channel network can be sniffed uh, it could be passive network tabs or even traffic monitoring devices uh, which can reveal data metadata signaling information and often <coughs> without uh, 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 FCSP2 based encryption capable uh, uh, SAN, a lot of the data is transmitted in clear text uh, and can be read by an <coughs> entity which is um, tapping on the network traffic. Uh, not only uh, getting access to confidential data, uh, storage sniffing can also be used to kind of host replay attacks, uh, 
using that mechanism and uh, just by definition a replay attack is when an attacker with malicious intent uh, captures a valid data transmission and then injects it back into the data stream uh, <coughs> again with uh, malicious intent. Uh, um, there are other uh, security threats. It could be uh, storage masquerading, uh, derived from the word mask, where an attacker uh, can insert a rogue storage device, which is not supposed to be part of the fiber channel SAN, with the intention of uh, capturing uh, data being transmitted by an initiator uh, through a fiber channel uh, switch, or worse off, uh, with an intent of modifying uh, <coughs> uh, the data. Um, beyond that, uh, there is potential threats around data corruption, which is very real in the world around us. Uh, data corruption can be uh, both intentional as well as accidental, <coughs> where, an, uh, for, where an attacker can data by gaining access to storage. Uh, and such attacks, especially silent data corruption, are extremely hard to detect uh, and often can have a significant impact to business continuity. <coughs> One example that we talked about earlier was uh, using worldwide name spoofing as one of the many tools that an attacker can have uh, to host uh, such an attack. Uh, other things, uh, <coughs> and certainly by no way this is a complete list uh, of the potential data center security attacks, but uh, threats, but another one within this list is uh, session hijacking, which uh, could potentially leverage uh, what many of us call uh, session ID weakness. Uh, within the fiber channel uh, kind of uh, process uh, in which a third party a malicious or somebody with malicious intent can take control of an existing session between two trusted uh, parties exchanging information because uh, through the process of sniffing or something similar they have gleaned the sequence ID and have predicted the sequence count to kind of uh, uh, hijack such a session. <coughs> in addition to these there are other attacks they could be kind of denial of service attacks uh, that people could uh, <coughs> do via RSC and flooding and things like that. Uh, fiber channel security, and especially uh, as defined by the Fiber Channel Security Protocol, FCSP, when implemented along with other safeguards, uh, can help uh, potentially mitigate many, if not all, of these data center threats. And as we go through the presentation, you will see how uh, the provisions defined by the security infrastructure that the fiber channel security protocol FCSP defines uh, can help thwart many of these threats and ultimately reduce uh, uh, risk within uh, the data center. Okay, so uh, what is, uh, I've been kind of talking about FCSP2, the fiber channel security protocol. Uh, you know, <clears throat> well, you know, fiber channel fabrics have been deployed across multiple different sites, uh, and then their, their security uh, and the security of the data that they transport is critical, right? Uh, we talked about existing mechanisms like zoning, LUN masking, and things like that, um, which are more, uh, <clears throat> you know, authorization and segmentation based. Uh, they may not be enough to protect um, the integrity and confidentiality of uh, fiber channel networks. Uh, and considering all the pale, all the kind of industry trends we spoke about, um, it is imperative to consider uh, in detail what the fiber channel uh, security protocol FCSP2 uh, can bring to fiber channel SANS. So uh, FCSP2, uh, that's the ANSI, INCITS, T11 committee is standard uh, called Fiber Channel Security Protocols 2. And what it does is it defines a security architecture for fiber channel networks, right? Uh, it specifies different protocols um, that are used to authenticate fiber channel devices. Again, going from segmentation uh, and authorization to authentication. It details the infrastructure to set up uh, encryption keys, negotiate parameters um, uh, so that you can ensure kind of frame by frame confidentiality as well as integrity. Beyond that, it kind of helps define what it should be to what are the, what, are, what, is, what should be the architecture uh, to distribute such uh, policies all across uh, uh, the network. Okay, so uh, 
uh, if you look at uh, the fiber channel stack here uh, towards the <coughs> right hand side picture, I'm not sure if you guys can see it on your uh, screen, but that's the typical fiber channel uh, five layer stack here starting from the physical interface, uh, the transmission protocol, uh, the framing and signaling which is FC2, common services and all the way up to uh, the upper layer or FC4. What uh, uh, fiber channel, what FCSP2 does is it defines two security protocols. Uh, for different portions of the fiber channel traffic. Um, there is the ESP header, uh, <coughs> um, or the, which is defined in framing and signaling, and then there is uh, a CT, uh, or common transport authentication, which is defined in FCGS4. Uh, <coughs> the encapsulated security protocol, or ESP header protocol, is, uh, you could call it a transform, which is applied to FC2 frames, uh, and it is based on a, a, a similar concept defined, I believe, in RFC 4303 for uh, IP-based networks, also called IP uh, ESP. And what this provides is it provides you origin authentication, integrity, anti-replay protection, uh, and confidential confidentiality of uh, generic fiber channel frames. Uh, very similar in concept. Uh, is uh, the common transport authentication, which provides pretty much the same set of security services, but for common transport or CT information units, which are generally used in fiber channel networks to convey control information. Not only that, there are kind of things uh, defined in RFC 4595, uh, <coughs> uh, which defines how uh, modifications to uh, the Ike V2 uh, standard, uh, which help uh, the IQ2 standard is defined for uh, uh, for IPsec, uh, <coughs> and that define and a modification of that in RFC 4595 uh, uh, defines how to use uh, the fiber channel authentication mechanism for uh, IQ2 uh, kind of exchange. And <coughs> uh, what happens here is security associations, uh, as uh, the, the RFC defines security associations. Uh, for both the ESP header as well as the CT authentication protocols, uh, between any two fiber channel entities, it could be between host to host, disk to disk, switch to switch, uh, um, and these are negotiated uh, uh, by the fiber channel security protocol, uh, which is uh, uh, as defined in RFC 4595. So before we jump kind of deeper uh, into uh, into the mechanics of how the fiber channel uh, security protocol works, let's quickly get some terms out of the way. Right? If you were reading the standard, uh, many of the terms would seem familiar to you, uh, and many could be new. So let's get them out of the way right here. Uh, the standard talks about entities uh, in its conversations about FCSP2. Entities are nothing but fiber channel devices. They could be uh, HBA is also called initiators. It could be switches, endpoints, uh, uh, storage controllers, and <coughs> things like that. Uh, uh, the security association, and uh, we'll talk more about, and, and Brandon will jump in and talk more about security associations, but uh, think of these as kind of shared attributes that are used to, between two communicating entities to ensure uh, uh, that <coughs> you know, uh, the entities are authorized to talk uh, uh, to each other. Uh, we talked about the ESP header as well as the CT authentication. The ESP is used for uh, uh, you know, uh, maintaining integrity and confidentiality of fiber channel data frames, and similarly the CT is used uh, uh, for integrity and confidentiality of the fiber channel control uh, frames. So do note that um, <coughs> um, uh, they are, th a single security association cannot define uh, how both the ESP as well as CT authentication uh, can work together. Different uh, associations are required for each one of them. Um, we also talked about uh, replay protection, <coughs> in which uh, attacker is able to kind of uh, uh, you know, replay valid frames and inject it back into into the network. Uh, um, and the fiber channel security protocol, uh, you know, outlines mechanisms how to thwart such attacks. Um, IQV2, like I mentioned here, that's uh, the IPsec uh, Internet Key Exchange version 2, uh, and uh, a, a variation of that is defined in RFC 4595 as to use how to use the IQ2 protocol uh, for fiber channels, uh, more specifically fiber channel uh, security. Okay. <coughs> so um, when you look at uh, can we look at 
when you look at uh, FCSP2, right, or Fiber Channel Security Protocol, you know, it encompasses uh, various set of components, uh, as you can see on the slide. Uh, and the, the security architecture that it defines can be broadly segregated uh, into uh, two pieces. Like starting off with, uh, oh, several pieces. Sorry, um, starting off with authentication infrastructure, uh, which defines kind of an architecture for you know, different types of authentication infrastructures, which could be secret-based, uh, certificate-based, password-based, uh, or even a pre-shared key-based uh, uh, authentication. <coughs> and as Brandon goes into the next uh, section of slides, he'll kind of talk to you more in detail about uh, uh, how these authentication infrastructures all work. Uh, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, all sort of different kind of uh, uh, use cases. Um, then comes authentication, which, uh, <coughs> which uh, the, the protocol defines uh, uh, what different authentication protocols that entities, like I defined earlier, which is just five channel nodes, uh, identity of the communicating entities, right, uh, in which uh, two entities may negotiate uh, if authentication is required, what authentication protocol they need to use. Uh, and this authentication protocol, like we discussed earlier, could be switch to switch, uh, node to switch, or even node to node. Uh, uh, various different protocols are defined uh, for this. Uh, there could be uh, the Diffie-Hillman uh, CHAP or Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, uh, which I believe is uh, mandatory by the Fiber Channel uh, SP2 standard. There are other protocols. There could be a Fiber Channel Certificate Authority Protocol or FCAP. There could be a Fiber Channel Password Authentication Protocol and leading all the way to the Security Association Management Protocol, which is IQV2. We talked about security associations. Uh, think of it as a subset of the IQV2 protocol as suitable for Fiber Channel in order to establish associations uh, between two communicating entities. Um, finally, cryptographic integrity and confidential confidentiality, my apologies. Uh, what this does, this is the crux of all the cryptographic work uh, that would uh, happen within the protocol, which is frame by frame integrity, confidentiality, and that enables replay protection. Uh, by making sure all the sequence numbers are tracked, the traffic origin authentication, which is kind of figuring out where the traffic is coming from. Uh, and both you could do this for both the ESP header as well as the CT authentication. Once again, the <coughs> um, while similar mechanisms are provided both for ESP header as well as CT, uh, the processing for both of them uh, are independent. Uh, and finally, uh, kind of authorization, which is uh, if you have all of these fabric policies, how do you distribute these uh, uh, policies across switches with different roles uh, uh, within a fiber channel SAN? So uh, having kind of put some context behind uh, the conversation in terms of uh, the key drivers, uh, introduction to the fiber channel security protocol, some of the threats that it has the potential to thwart, I would pass it off uh, uh, to Brandon here who will kind of double click into uh, some of the things that I have outlined uh, to take you deep into uh, you know the inner workings and definitions of FCSP2. Brandon. Thank you, Nishant. Um, so as we move forward, um, Matt, do we have any questions you'd like to um, answer at this point? There are a couple questions, but I think that you're probably going to be covering them in this section. So I'm going to hold off until, until the end. Perfect. So this is um, um, kind of a, so this is actually from the FCSP2 um, standard. This is a uh, just a description of the overall generic authentication transaction. This happens when you log into Fabric or when you um, log into the endpoint if you do end to end, um, but just covers basically uh, the concept of authentication, right? So the you know I have an initiator, I have a responder, um, I send some something across the wire that says hey. Here's my usable protocols and parameters. This is what I can do. Uh, the guy will respond back with a message saying, oh, this is what I can do. Um, at that point, the initiator will decide, okay, what do I want to send over the wire? Um, I don't want to send anything in clear. I want to, you know, hash, passwords, and stuff like that. Um, that off message will get across back to the um, uh, authentication responder. He'll take a look at it. Um, he'll respond um, based on the criteria, the algorithm, the crypto suites, and those things that have been chosen. Um, and then it'll either be accepted or rejected um, as the transaction happens. So this is a generic look at the authentication process. Uh, we have several different um, ways to do this in the standard. Um, and so we'll, talk, we'll 
transition to that in the next slide. Um, basically, um, there's two types, there's two steps here. One is authenticating um, two devices together. And the authentication is actual dual. I, but it's a mutual authentication, so uh, device A authenticates device B, device B authenticates device A. A key may be established. Um, if the key is established, then it can be used to uh, set up a security association. Um, and then the different authentication types are here at the bottom. So the first one, um, that was, and this is the mandated one, is DHCAP. Um, this is a um, CHAP. Um, is an older protocol from the 90s that was used for dial-up connections, but it's a very nice way, a simple way to be able to do a challenge handshake, um, to be able to uh, validate that two people share the same secret. Um, and so it's basically a secret-based authentication and key management protocol. Um, if you add a DH chap uh, with a null option is a, a standard chap, um, default to standard chap. Uh, DH stands for uh, Diffie-Hellman, and so Diffie-Hellman, if you add different types of Diffie-Hellman groups to the uh, protocol exchange, it makes it harder for people to figure out what the, what the shared secret is. Um, and so uh, DH is, is um, a you know, selectable security parameter that will be um, allocated or decided upon in the negotiation for the security protocol. Um, the second one is a fiber channel certificate authentication protocol, or this is FCAP. And this is when we actually use X509 certificates um, to, for authentication and um, key um, management protocol. Um, basically, this means that each switch has an X509 certificate. It could be manual and it could also be signed. And so if it's signed, then I need to have a root certificate. I need access to a root certificate server. It could be both an internal-based or an external-based um, uh, certificate server. Uh, but this is when I'm starting to do uh, uh, you know, public private key uh, negotiation for um, the different parameters in the crypto suite as I do the authentication process. Um, a third one is fiber channel password authentication protocol. Um, and this is uses uh, password-based authentication and key management that uses SRP algorithm. Um, this is defined in RFC um, 2945. Uh, but this is a different way. It's a different way to be able to communicate um, between the two um, protocols based on, you know, not necessarily, a, a difference isn't necessarily a password. The difference is really around SRP, uh, which provides a different type of negotiation to make sure that I don't exchange keys in the clear. Um, and then a new one that came in, and so those three there were defined in FC-SP, the first version. Uh, FC-SP2 um, actually um, added a new one, um, and this is the fiber channel extensible authentication protocol. And this is, enables a greater flexibility for fiber channels to leverage um, an infrastructure that somebody may already have. And so, um, so basically there's a, uh, and this is an extensible authentication protocol um, that people may be supporting for other things and may have the key management and secret management in place. Um, it's defined in RFC uh, 3748, um, but we'll be able to support even a greater set of different um, flexible protocols for authentication. And this will enable us to tie into the infrastructure or the tools that customers already have. And then if we go all the way down to security uh, association management protocol, um, this is really IKV2 um, dash auth. Uh, we kind of break up uh, IKV2 into an authorization, authentication um, uh, process, and then a, a, a key negotiation and the security association setup process. Um, and so this would be the authentic using IKV2 for authentication um, and all the you know, benefits that you get with, uh, with that protocol. Um, those are the five different ones that we, well, we talked about for authentication infrastructure. Then we um, create, uh, we authenticate, we provide keys, we create keys, and then we can actually do different types of things with ESP or the C, uh, CP transport. Um, the authentication type is either secrets uh, or keys or password. Those are all things that a user would create. Um, passwords tend to be things people can remember. Secrets can be more random. Keys can be more random. Uh, but they all fall in the general classification of something that I've created on a server or in some kind of process, maybe manual process, and I have to enter on both sides. Certificates um, can be unsigned certificates. Um, this is one I can negotiate with my, um, uh, my, my credentials and my um, both my public and private key um, to be able to validate um, that we're you know, exactly sending the exact message and then we have the same secret on both sides. Um, so certificates can be um, both private 
public, it can be internal and public, and then you know all the way to back to a, a, a public um, certification authority. Um, so those are different things that can be used for authentication. They have to have the management infrastructure in place um, in terms of able to populate and for the devices know which things can be authenticated and what to do with the different policies. Um, security associations. So what I just discussed is authentication. And from the standard point of view, as long as I, I authenticate, I can be SCSP or SC, uh, SC2 compliant. If you want to take the next step and go beyond just authentication and start setting up, you know, both um, ESP protocol, which can be used both for integrity and confidentiality and anti-replay, um, as well as the uh, CT authentication um, piece of this, um, then we'll start building up security associations. And so we use a subset of the IC, uh, V2 protocol um, that's defined, as Nishant said, um, in uh, 4595. The Babel says, okay, this is how we apply the IC2 protocol to fiber channel. Um, and it's just basically an information-based um, RFC that tells, explains how we use it. Um, so security um, associations uh, specify traffic selectors per, um, you know, per uh, link of encryption. So if I'm doing end-to-end -end encryption, it's um, between each two endpoints, very similar to uh, what you'd see in, in IPsec for VPNs. Um, what you'd also see is uh, if I'm just doing point to point, um, that might be all I need to do is have one security selector for that connect for that link and one security uh, for CT authentication, uh, which is to the management server. Uh, but security associations, you set up an initial security association, then you set up a, and then from there you can drive a child um, security association with a different key. That way you can rotate keys without actually having to re-establish um, a complete um, ICE, um, uh, transaction. Um, there's two mechanisms that are available to protect traffic. Um, we, we leverage ESB header. Um, and so we, I'm leveraging the exact spelling out of standard for ESB header. It's similar to, um, it's, it's defined, um, as Michelle said, um, in the fiber channel um, for SC2 frames to protect data. So this protects everything in the SC2 layer um, that Michelle talked about. And it leverages the similar type of protection um, ESP that's used in IPsec. So I can um, either turn on authentication, I can do anti-replay, and if I want to, I can actually turn on encryption, and that protects the entire packet um, in terms of the headers. And we'll talk about the headers in a moment. Um, and then CT authentication. Uh, CT um, are, it stands for common transport, and this is a layer four protocol in fiber channel. This is what the, the fabric uses for authentication, um, or sorry, management traffic, um, fabric services, and stuff like that across the fabric. And so that's a place where you know you can provide authentic protection of really management traffic. Um, each SA defines, and this is standard um, from um, from other stuff. So we're just leveraging best practice from the industry. I've got a spy sequence number counter and parameters for selected transforms. And so I know the transform. I know the number. You know the sequence. I know the SPI. So SPI says which SA applies to this certain packet, um, and it goes through the whole process and enables the rest of the encryption authentication, uh, sorry, uh, integrity and, and stuff like that to be done. Um, ICSA is used for secure SA management functions, such as creating um, child SAs um, and for secure SC uh, traffic. So I can rotate. One thing that's in uh, that we require in NVMe, uh, sorry, uh, FCSP2 is the ability to rekey, and this the IC SA enables us to be able to do that. Um, then part of this, we define a security social database that store for fiber channels. So it's a common standard way for people to, do, um, to um, uh, you know, store and keep and communicating essays uh, across the fabric. And this is uh, basically uh, part of the standard and something that people um, who are building switches and, and devices would be able to, uh, to build into their solution to support SCSP and support essays. The way this looks is, um, so when I talk about the uh, authentication infrastructure and then the authentication where I create um, session keys um, or really the security association establishment are two different pieces of the standard. So authentication uh, uh, negotiation, I can actually use DHCAP, DHCAP with a null, FCAP, FC path, FC uh, EAP, and IK, IK, uh, V2 auth. Those are all different things that I can use to create my SAs. Uh, for the ones in red, for the four, first four, I then use um, you know the output of that process to create in a 
IQV2 authentication. Um, I start now negotiating my key sessions, and I create my my secure uh, my essays for either the ESP header or the CT authentication. Um, if I use the complete IQV2 auth version of this, I actually can go directly. Um, I create both the authentication and the keys in the same you know, process because IQV2 standard actually covers both of those. Um, you might say, hey, which one would I like to support? Um, and so customers and, and partners and implementers can actually pick which one makes sense and which one the industry is going with and which one's the easiest to, to implement and deploy um, in the field. So authentication options. Um, authentication is always um, available from you know, switch to switch. Um, you know, and I should say it's always available for a mutual authentication. Um, it's available in three different flavors. Um, one is switch to switch, so the two switches authenticate. And this is important when a switch joins the fabric. You don't want somebody plugging um, an accidental switch or the wrong switch um, and creating problems in the fabric. This creates authentication. That way you can control how things connect to the fabric. Device to switch, that covers both the initiator and target. Uh, once again, mutual authentication uh, for device to connect to the fabric. And then there's also the device device. So this can go end to end um, uh, from one device to the other. And this is once again mutual authentication. Uh, something from switch to switch, you could actually do switch to switch in different data centers where some links between data centers you want to authenticate, some links inside this uh, data center, a secure data center you don't. Um, and so there's different pieces and different ways that you can implement um, each one of these authentications and how you deploy your infrastructure. So authorization access control. So there's fabric policies also defined in SCSP. Uh, they're basic uh, authorization controls in form of access control lists. And this is, and there's two halves. You can deploy things that are fabric wide. Um, so this device can connect to this fabric, or I can. You can also deploy, um, specify them as switch wide, so that this a policy only applies to the specific switch. So maybe I have a server that I only want to connect to the specific switch. Inside, so only authenticate and authorize it to that switch itself. Um, policy, you know, policy enforcement occurs when a connection is attempted, um, and so this is when I connect into or a management application tries to access the management services of the fabric. And during when this happens, there's a policy check, um, especially when two switches join together. Um, so you don't want to send the policy in the clear to the next switch. In the policy check, there's actually a way to hash everything together so that you can identify a policy. And as the hash is matched between the two, then they're enabled to join. And if they don't, then they're, the uh, fabric's kept safe, separate. The FCSP2 header, um, this is what protects data, so I'll focus a little more on that. Um, but basically, I've got uh, origin, so basically in the standard, uh, for SV2, we said, okay, you can put an ASP header and ESP trailer. Uh, your payload gets a little smaller, um, but this will how it form, formats into fiber channel. And then ESP header covers origin authentication, integrity, anti-replay protection, and confidentiality. And now we can, you know, um, the next course defined an RFC 4303. Um, and then you can also add encryption if you decide to add the encryption policy. Um, SCSP3 uh, three defines headers for um, fiber channel, uh, FCSP defines how to use ESP in fiber channel. Uh, similar protection exists for CT authentication to protect the management payload um, in terms of uh, security. Uh, it's managing secrets and, and pushing on beyond the edge. So this is, tends to be um, not um, def to, you know, totally defined in terms of the standard. Uh, the standard says, hey, when I have all these secrets, when I distribute these secrets um, across the uh, the fabric, I need now to figure out a way to um, share them. So the way that it was initially done with um, DHF was to use a radius server and be able to distribute certain secrets or bear, uh, validate secrets uh, via the radius server. And this is a way to start um, handling the scale of, de of, of credentials that you'll need to manage. Um, so basically, for mutual authentication, you need the dev either the device, the adjacent device, or end nodes if you're doing end to end. Um, it could be easily you can see up to 50,000 or more credentials in a larger fabric, and end up having uh, two um, per per port. Um, and then there's different ways to do this. And so uh, there's you know I can use Radius for DHCAP. I uh, KMIP is a standard for key sharing from Oasis. 
I can use a, a public certificate authority or internal certificate authority based on the authentication infrastructure I choose and what I'd like to do. Uh, so this tends to be um, the next step. And in, in, in once you say, hey, I'm going to authenticate everything, the next step is asking how am I going to manage all the secrets and the passwords and certs across the fabric. Um, so summary pieces of SCSP2. Um, it supports in-band authentication, confidential traffic, mutual authentication, supports creation of trusted fabrics and fiber channel SAN infrastructure, protects against certain operator errors and make cable misconne uh, misconnections, improves um, scalability promise and new, uh, new zoning approach. So there's actually a better zoning approach provided in SCSP2 uh, that vendors can choose to support. Uh, it supports data protection and flight. Uh, supports checking and network configuration and for multi-fabric environments. Uh, standard conformance, uh, FCSP requires DHCAP with an all option for authentication. FCSP2 adds support of auth A compliance. Um, and this means I'm just adding a DHCAP uh, process um, other than null uh, for authentication. And also adds the ability to re-authenticate. Um, just to bring this back up to the next level, um, this FCSP is a very important part of, of take a, you know consideration, plan out for your security infrastructure. Um, but it's also really important to look at all the different pieces also of security that goes in your data center. Uh, Nistron said, "Hey, um, fiber channel is an air gap network. It's tend to be secure. People have been trusting their most secure data fiber channel, you know, for 20, 25 years." Um, Here's all other things people can use and leverage for their data security, their storage security strategy, if you will. Um, physical entrance, screen management interfaces, encryption data at rest, which can be from a disk to the database, data flight encryption, um, negative impacts of encryption, uh, such as you start blocking dedupe and compression um, operations on, on the wire or at rest, zone masking, zoning, MPIV, uh, security between data centers versus within a data center, where you have different zones of security. Proof of encryption that if you do have like a disk stolen, um, that everything on there is actually encrypted. Uh, so you have to have proof of that. Secret password certificate management, vendor support, and of course add to this um, all the benefits you get from SCSP2. Sounds fantastic. I think um, at this point in time, we can probably start to enter in a couple of questions that have come up uh, as a result of, uh, of this fantastic webinar, if I may say so myself. Um, let's, let's, um, let's start from the beginning, so to speak. So uh, I guess the question really is, with all of this, this toy box of tools that we have, what would you recommend that somebody who wants to get started with this, where would they begin? What, where would they start? to try to figure out how to begin with a, an SP2 type of implementation? I'll, I'll take that, uh, Jay. So I know, <clears throat> I think um, before you, uh, before, about my recommendation generally is kind of, before you start thinking about a specific standard or a protocol, I think it, it all starts, A, with assessing the need to protect, right? Uh, assessing, looking at uh, uh, what fiber channel does within your data center, right? Uh, what, the, how confidential that data is, how important it is to have, to maintain integrity of that data. And once you assess that there is an absolute need, to, <clears throat> A, you first need to review all the existing security mechanism, including physical security, segregation. You know, there are simple things, for example, a lot of time production data centers are very well secured. But it's, it is, I see it more than often where <clears throat> while production data centers, uh, uh, data servers are secured, there are always kind of development environments which do have access uh, into the production environment to run test and dev. And you know those are potential uh, security vulnerabilities where attackers can get in. Like we said, right? No amount of security is enough. Uh, need for authentication and encryption within your fiber channel SAN. FCSP2 is uh, you know is a great standard. <coughs> and uh, like Brandon said, uh, there are implementations available today. Uh, 
that does that implement the authentication uh, piece of this. And uh, you know, I always uh, recommend in order to get vendor neutral information, it is best to go to some place like FCIA, maybe this webinar, read the standard, and get an unbiased opinion from there. Makes Back sense. To you, Brandon, did you want to include? Okay, but Brandon, you want to include anything in there, or? Um yeah, I think um, if you're going to directly say uh, where is the first place I should look for this, it's, if you look at security, right, within a data center, it's pretty good. Your doors are locked. If somebody gets in your data center, somebody can pick up a disk and walk out. That's a lot different than between data centers, right, or where you have um, a com lines of communication that are in less secure areas or across the town or something like that. Um, so you could actually start applying um, FCSP2 um, or other stuff to be able to encrypt data between data centers. So that's probably the first place we see the need for encryption. Um, and then, of course, always secure all your management interfaces. So the whole management infrastructure for SCSP2, um, you're only secure your weakest link, and so you need to make sure the management infrastructure is all correctly authenticated, um, encrypted, and, and set up correctly. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I mean, security and being secure is a holistic enterprise. So, um, I, I, you know, in, in some cases, if it, depending on how flip you wish to be, um, it, 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 you, need to, you need to have your toe in the ocean, and um, there really is no starting place in that. You, you really, especially when you're talking about encrypting between data centers and the distance makes the propeller spin the other way, you, you, there's no wrong place to start, it, it seems to me. I think that you, you need to be able to understand from inside the fabric, from between the fabrics, especially over distance, that as long as you're starting, um, you know, with, um, you know, starting at some points, you're going to have to cover all the bases anyway. There's no single source of, of a starting point for that um, because there's, there's different layers of security at different layers of the, of the fiber channel uh, protocol as well as, you know, what happens when you start mixing and matching like FCIP. There's a bunch of stuff you have to do. So, um, the, I think the, for one of the first places that you need to do is do a, 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 an audit of all the touch points that have to be secure. And then each of those different touch points, you can then apply some of the stuff that we've been talking about today as well. So uh, as long as all the bases are covered holistically, your starting point um, is, is going to be one of many. So I, I, I agree with that completely. Um, another question uh, has come in, uh, and I think that this is probably a fair one. Um, we, we talk about the benefits and we talk about the positives about the fiber channel security, but there's a trade-off. There's always trade-offs. So one of the questions that came in wants, to, wants us to elaborate a bit more on the negative impacts, so the performance, those kinds of things that happen with, with security in the array uh, on, the, on the storage side in particular. Um, and since Nishan took it the first time, I'm going to go with you, Brandon, first to, to, to try to balance it out. Yeah, so uh, when you look at, you know, encryption, right? So this is when I say the negative impacts of encryption. Um, so if I start encrypting things, um, which is great because it's confidential, keeps us, you know, can't see it. Um, then we start adding um, key management. And, you know, basically once the data comes across the network encrypted, you know, do I have the right key? Can I set up the authentication? Can I set up a security associations correctly? Um, and then if you're in an array, because uh, I'm going to talk about data in flight. Data at rest has a, a lot more implications, but that's beyond this discussion. So data in flight, which is covered by SCSP2, um, I end up having kind of like a, a setup like a VPN where I could have um, tons of hosts, you know, maybe 100 hosts all acting in the same array, and then I have to set up the security associations for everyone. Everyone would have a different key. They could get rekeyed differently, so I've got to track all the security associations um, as everyone comes in. So again, I'm now authenticating everybody. I'm now building up uh, all the different um, encryption, um, you know, uh, security associations. And I got to look up every packet when it comes in. I got to put it against the, uh, the, the list of the security database, if you will, um, that we talked about before, and then apply encryption. So it tends to get hard and complex very quickly, um, just like we see in VPN. Excellent. Uh, Nishan, you have a, something to, uh, to add, add to that? Uh, sure, Jay. But I think uh, one common thing that we kind of when we discuss with customers is uh, when people are using uh, 
uh, long distance links between switches between different data centers. Uh, I think uh, Brandon alluded to this earlier. Uh, if you have uh, <coughs> encryption of data in flight, it is uh, there are services like compression that happen between inter-switch links that could uh, potentially can no longer happen because the data is encrypted. Uh, and another kind of general guidance that I would say it's uh, encryption of data in flight is a, is a good thing. But remember, just like locking a door in, into your home, you need to make sure every time you need to go in, you need the key so there is potentially some performance impact of how fast you can get inside the home. Other remember that you can't lose the key, otherwise you will lose access to that data. Um, so, uh, you know, some general common sense also prevails there. Sounds good. Um, I, I think these are all really good advice. And we're, we're kind of coming up close to the top of the hour, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, beg off on some of the rest of the questions. We will be providing a question and answer blog in the near future, uh, derived from your questions of this webinar. Uh, and anything else that comes in after after the session is over, we'll be we'll be um, providing those answers in a, in a, a separate blog about this. Um, I do want to remind you further uh, that we have a series, a, a long series of of webinars about this. The next one is going to be scaling Fiber Channel. One of the main advantages of Fiber Channel is uh, is the fact that you can pretty much have predictable performance from your uh, from your 10th node to your 10,000th node. Uh, it makes Fiber Channel rather unique as a storage network for this. In this webinar for Scaling Fiber Channel, we'll be talking about how to actually do that. What are the mechanisms inside of the protocol as well as the implementations that allow you to do this to make, make it kind of unique to Fiber Channel. So we'll be talking about this. Please follow us on Twitter for STIA News for the specific date and time. Um, we'll be announcing that as well on our um, on our website, fiberchannel.org. Uh, so um, before you uh, go, please don't forget to rate this event. Um, if you have constructive criticism, uh, we, we always want to hear about it. If there's something you like, great. If something you didn't like, please share that as well. All of that stuff is extremely important to us, and we try to, uh, uh, we, we try to pay particular attention to the kind of feedback that we get. So we can only do that if we actually get it. Please do leave your feedback for us. Um, please don't forget that we've got an entire library of Fiber Channel educational programs, uh, everything from FC NVMe to FICOM, since Fiber Channel to performance, and uh, the, the newest uh, speed on the block, 64 gig Fiber Channel, uh, and how all that works. Lots and lots of stuff from the beginning. Uh, for, the, for the beginner all the way up to the experts. So if you're just beginning out with Fiber Channel, uh, please take a look at some of the stuff that we've got for, for the Back to Basics. If you're more experienced or you want to find out some of the, um, some of the more advanced stuff, uh, we've got that as well, everything from the, uh, how to use the, the um, analysis uh, programs to uh, FICON. We've got, we got, we got a lot of different types of, of product, uh, projects for you to pay attention to. So um, to that end, I believe we're going to be able to get some um, the link. And in fact, uh, let's see, you uh, don't, I'll be putting a link into the, uh, if I can find the right button, <laughs> it always seems to be, it escapes me. Uh, we'll be applying, uh, providing you the link to the actual slides of this presentation shortly. You may uh, be able to see this on your screen uh, very soon, as soon as I can as, as I said, I, I can figure out how to, how to put this put this in. Nevertheless, um, I want to thank you, our audience, very much for attending today. I want to thank our, our uh, illustrious presenters, uh, Brandon Hoff and Nishant Loda, for taking time out of their day to come and talk about this with you. Um, hope to have them back again. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, if it, worst comes to worst, you can always see these present, this presentation and the others and all the slides available at fiberchannel.org. So thank you very much, and I will uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.